Excellent. Welcome everyone to the Sangwil Club, uh, second to last um, Sangwil of the academic year, um, as the academic next academic year starts in October. We are uh, particularly happy to have uh, Karim Jarvi in the in in the Sangwil. We I think invited Karim, you know, like a year ago. And we were sort of back and forth. The life is crazy, you know, not, not now, Tristan, but it would be really interesting. Let's chat. Yeah, turn, turn, turn. And in the end, you know, I always have this sort of backlog of people that we would like to bring to the Sangwil. Um, Karim, you know, finally said, yes, let's do it now. Um, so we had a nice chat about, you know, what would, should I present, etc. So I can tell, despite, you know, whatever you can read online, I can tell that Karim took very seriously the talk because he said, let's have a meeting and chat about what you think is good for this type of audience. And that I've only done twice or three times in four years of coordinating the Sunday, like a real talk about what was interesting, etc. So that's maybe is the best way to introduce Karim because everything else you can read online and etc. Other than that, I heard him speak, he's a great, uh, speaker, and I hope you enjoy um, the talk. Um, if anything comes to mind, you can still put it in the chat. And if it's something that it needs a clarification, you can, you know, briefly interrupt Karim and, you know, you know, clarify. But let's keep, let's let him go with the flow, and then we have a discussion at the end. Um, welcome, Karim. Thank you so much, Tristan, uh, for this uh, wonderful opportunity. Um, I'm really happy that, as you said, we managed uh, finally to make this uh, make this happen despite very busy schedules for all of us. So, so um, I'm really delighted um, to give a talk at the Sangwil Club. Um, so, yeah, thanks to you uh, for this. Now, uh, I would, before I start, I'd like to, uh, as usual, acknowledge that uh, where I'm giving this talk from, Montreal, um, is uh, the traditional and unceded territory of the uh, Kanya Nikihaka, the Mohawk place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among nations. Um, and I did a little bit of research before, uh, actually yesterday, before uh, giving this talk, and I had also some questions to Tristan. Um, but um, given that this is the Sangwil Club, um, I, I took a little uh, look at some of um, Oliver Sangwil's legacy, what he's known for. And one thing that I found on, on Wikipedia where I found interesting is that um, Professor Sangwil also saw it as his responsibility to supervise uh, any PhD student, apparently, whose interests did not correspond to those of any of his colleagues. And, and this sounds like something, at least nowadays, super dangerous. I don't know if I would be able to do something like this, um, even though, come to think about it, I do have, uh, if I look at the breadth of, of research topics that my students are working on in the lab right now, that it range from looking at creativity processes in the brain to uh, the effect of psychedelics or dreaming um, or decision-making or memory, um, I do sometimes feel like I, I end up uh, giving opportunities to students who, uh, who don't get supervised by others in the, in the department. So this is something that I maybe have in common with that. Um, now, the topic of the, of the talk today, and, and again, this was following a discussion I had with Tristan, uh, was to focus on this notion of data-driven neuroscience versus hypothesis-driven research uh, in, in neuroscience. Um, because um, there are many questions that need to be asked, specifically now with, with the surge that we see in machine learning-based approaches. Um, and many of us wonder, um, you know, hypothesis-driven research also relies on data, right? So, so what, what is the real question here? What is the real issue? Um, it's not in one case we're using data and the other one we're not using really data. So what really happened? Um, I think what happened is that we simply moved on from the uh, ice age uh, to the age of AI nowadays and machine learning, big data. So what does this mean? I mean, this, we see today sort of a, what we'd like to call a renaissance of AI which is fueled by uh, the surge in the availability of data, but also in computational power. So many of the algorithms that, you'll be, that you hear about that are being used a lot uh, nowadays in, in machine learning based uh, research, many of them actually were around for quite a while, but they were not really useful yet because they needed a lot of computational power and they needed also huge amounts of data. 
And so this led to the current um, excitement around fields that is loosely called uh, data science. Um, and obviously, uh, big data. so th this brings the question that I would like to discuss uh, today, which is, um, well, if, if now everything is gonna be data driven and we have so much access to data and, and so many powerful techniques, does this mean that we're slowly dropping um, good old hypothesis driven research um, in cognitive neuroscience? Um, so I suggest we come back to this question later and that we first go on to uh, sort of comparing and looking at the tools um, that we use for these different types of approaches. So in many cases when we're doing um, hypothesis driven research uh, and classical approaches in, in, in psychology or cognitive neuroscience or neuroimaging, we use classical statistics um, that involve hypothesis testing, statistical inferences, and most of the time it's in sample analysis. So basically you take the whole data you have and you, you run all sorts of, um, of statistical um, analysis on it to try and extract some information, what we call inference. And you're trying to um, validate or invalidate your null hypothesis. And uh, on the other hand, and this is what you see on the right hand side of the screen now, um, is what we refer to as statistical learning. And in statistical learning, what we're doing is we're learning, we're, we're using algorithms that learn patterns out of the data. And so as opposed to class classical statistical inference, what you'd be doing here is out of sample generalization. So on one hand, on the left hand side, you have in sample studies, and on the right hand side, you have out of sample studies. And what is out of sample, to put it simply, it basically seek, it's an approach that seeks to extrapolate a, learn, a model that has learned from um, some data and extrapolate that model to uh, new data points that were not actually used to train the model in the first place. And I'll describe this in more detail afterwards. So it seems that we have this, um, this back and forth or this, this debate between in sample and, um, and out of sample. Um, and actually, I'm just going to take the opportunity to hear, and this is going to probably reveal the age of, of, of people in the audience, but I'm going to ask you this question. Who, who knows what this video, um, what this clip is, which video clip is this? So this is an excerpt of a video clip, and I can, I can tell you it was 1987. Feel free to write in the chat um, if you know the name of the band or the song. I'm going to give you two seconds for that. But I just felt that this picture here really captures this debate uh, or this um, um, ongoing discussions between people saying, well, everybody's using machine learning, but you know, why, why is it useful in any, in, in any, in any sense and stuff? And others you know, uh, claiming the opposite, that we can actually learn by developing models. Um, so the answer to the quiz is new order, of course. Um, this one is True Faith, it's 1987. Um, again, so on the left-hand side, infer inferential statistics, that's where we look at correlational methods such as Pearson correlation, Spearman chi-square, we do comparisons of means like in a t-test, as regression, simple and multiple, and we have non-parametric approaches. On the right-hand side, most of the time, if you're talking about out-of-sample generalization in your data exploration, you'll be using a machine learning approach, so training model in your data and then testing it on out-of-sample um, examples. Okay. So um, I'm not going to tell you anything about classical inference statistics because I'm, this is something everybody is probably familiar with. Um, but um, again, after discussion with Tristan, I thought this could be interesting here to take some time. I'm going to take about 15 to 20 minutes um, to give an overview um, of machine learning and the basics of machine learning. And I realize that this part is, might, for a few of you who are very, are very familiar with this, this might be boring, so this is the time for you maybe to grab a, go make yourself a cup of tea or something. Um, but I do think for those who are not familiar with what is machine learning, what is artificial intelligence, this might, might be a nice opportunity for a 15 minutes crash course into the basics so that we know what we're talking about when we refer to these methods, when we use them in the context of neuroscience. Okay, so let's start then. So the goal of this uh, 101 quick 15 minute or 20 minute primer on uh, machine learning is to take you from this position where uh, those of you who are not familiar obviously with, with machine learning uh, to this other position where you'll be able to be geeky and understand uh, what the machine is, is, is talking about. 
So the first step here, I, I don't know if there are uh, any questions. I see there's some points lighting up on my screen. So um, feel free to interrupt um, uh, and also to ask a question in the chat, uh, but I'm not monitoring the chat. Okay, so some nomenclature, first of all, it is quite messy because many of you um, have heard about all the successes of AI and artificial intelligence. Um, AlphaGo is one example. So uh, DeepMind's um, algorithm um, beating the, the, the world's best player, the game of Go, Lee Sido from Korea. Um, and the reason this is a bit confusing is that when this is reported in the media, it's really not quite clear what actually allowed the machine to beat the human player. Is it artificial intelligence per se that did it? Was it machine learning? Was it deep learning? And what is the difference between these terms? Again, as I said, I promise you, this is really a basic introduction to the, to the terms, but I, I think in some cases it's really useful. So artificial intelligence is the larger um, um, term and it, and it basically back in the 50s, it, it stems back from the original idea of trying to, to mimic uh, biological intelligence um, and to mimic the brain. Um, and typically, the very first machines that learn to play chess, as you know, from the first examples of artificial intelligence. Um, within the larger field of artificial intelligence, there's a, um, a subfield which we refer to as machine learning. So machine learning is part of AI. And typically, one example is um, the, the algorithm in your mailbox that's going to sort out for you what emails um, are spam and which ones are the ones that you should probably attend to. So that's a typical example of a machine learning task where the algorithm learns to identify based on a lot of examples to identify a spam from non-spam email. Now, within the field of machine learning, there are many subfields. One of them is the one we refer to as deep learning, which is one example, one approach to doing machine learning. And so another way to put the same thing, the larger circle here is artificial intelligence within that machine learning, within that artificial neural networks, and a subfield of that is deep learning. And another term that I mentioned earlier is data science. And so this is a multidisciplinary field, and it seems like pretty much everything goes into and somehow is related to or leads to some data science uh, research. So ranging from data engineering to domain expertise, hacker mindset, visualization, advanced computing, statistics, maths, everything. Um, and so, which also means that this becomes now a sort of a, a tricky field because in many cases, we're not really quite sure what you're talking about if you say that you're doing data science. And it seems like it's something that many people just put on in their LinkedIn account when they're looking for a job. And you don't really know what a, to what extent people are involved in data science and what it really means. If you know how to manipulate Excel tables, does that make you data scientist? Probably does. So now let's go to some definitions. Um, so again, the basic definition of machine learning. So machine learning at its most basic um, interpretation or, or definition is the practice of using algorithms to parse data, learn from the data, and then make a determination or a prediction about something in the world. Right? So you're learning from the data as opposed to having hard-coded uh, rules about how to, um, how to manipulate the data. Again, so rather than hand coding software routines with a specific set of instructions to accomplish a particular task, the machine itself will be trained to use, in many cases, large amounts of data, um, and that will give it the ability to learn how to perform the task. So the rules are not explicitly instructed to the machine, but the machine learns the rules. Now I'm gonna go through a number of distinctions that I, I hope will be useful for those of you who are new to the field. Uh, we talk a lot about supervised versus unsupervised learning. So supervised learning is where the data has labels. So you have class that are predetermined, for example, patients and controls, or uh, condition A and condition B. So those uh, would, would be labels attached to the data. Unsupervised learning, um, by contrast, is when the data doesn't have any labels. Um, and this is also an interesting question because in some cases, for example, if you think about uh, patients with a pathology that is very heterogeneous, heterogeneous um, there might be sub, uh, subgroups within the group of patients, but you might not really know um, the, how to distinguish between them. But the data, if you use a data-driven approach, you might be able to identify clusters within that group 
uh, based on some unsupervised learning. So um, you know, one example of an unsupervised approach is a principal component analysis, many of you are familiar with, and we'll come back to this later. So what's the basic idea behind supervised learning? Um, and basically what we have, we have data that we use for training, and we're gonna train algorithm with it or model. Also talk about a classifier. And then once that classifier or that model has been trained with the training data in blue, we're going to bring in a test set. So these are samples that were not seen when you trained your, your model, right? And then you're gonna look at the performance of your classifier on the test set. In other words, how well it was able to classify uh, those data points. And that's gonna give you uh, an idea about the performance um, of your, uh, your classifier. So, uh, so far, uh, so good for everybody. Now, um, let's take a more concrete example. Assuming you have a lot of, um, a lot of uh, music samples from two categories, uh, on one hand, uh, jazz, and uh, on the other hand, punk music. Um, and now what you want to do, I'm just gonna illustrate here how you use a supervised learning algorithm, a machine learning algorithm to, to do this classification. So you'd be given, giving these samples, a lot of examples of music files that come from um, free, uh, say jazz music and punk. And your classifier is going to try to learn the rules that allows it to distinguish between those. So you're giving, you're telling the classifier, this is jazz, this is punk, this is jazz, and this is punk, right? So you give the answers. It's like you're teaching a kid. Um, so you give the answers, and then the algorithm tries to identify rules that allows it to classify these data points. Then what you do after this, you arrive with test samples. Now, test samples are examples of data that, uh, again, here is going to be music files that the algorithm has not seen in the past. But now what the algorithm is gonna do is gonna to try to answer the question, is this punk or jazz, um, these new data, uh, new examples of segments of music um, without having seen them in the past, just based on its experience learning from the training set. And so let's assume here that it's outputting punk, then jazz, um, and then punk. And for this last example here, let's say this one is a more difficult one. Um, this is just the war, and this is going to be free jazz, but let's say the machine says it's part, but it's not. So in this case, as you can tell here, you have three correct answers and one mistake. So the machine, based on what it learned from all the examples, uh, music files, is on the test set, it had three uh, correct answers, one wrong. And so now if I ask you what is the performance of this machine learning algorithm at this stage, once it has been trained, um, you'd probably all agree that its decoding accuracy is at 75%, right? One mistake out of uh, four samples. Okay, so this is, so now you're asking, okay, but how does it actually perform this training? So you can either give the raw data, in this case, for example, it can be WAV files, so these are audio files. Um, and most of the time what happens in, in, in many of the techniques used, um, is a step we call feature extraction. So instead of using the actual wave files and handing that in straight to the machine, um, in many cases, not all the time, but in many cases, you have good reasons um, to know that there are features that are important for this classification. So for example, the beats per minute or the pitch or the presence or not of uh, vocals and things like that. So all of these things are things that you can, you know are, in, are useful, so it's domain knowledge you know it's useful to help your classifier learn. So you can extract those from the data and you feed those features to your classifier to learn. Now, because we're talking about neuroscience, we can take this one step further in the analogy and now assuming we don't want to classify the music files per se, but we want to classify brain activity of individuals listening to music. So can I tell from your brain activity whether you're listening to, um, to jazz music or whether you're listening to punk music? This is a typical nice example for a machine learning uh, task. Uh, but again, you exactly essentially do the same thing. Instead of um, providing the algorithm with the audio signal, you'll provide the algorithm with the brain signals. And you can also do feature extraction. So if you think, for example, oscillations in the alpha band or in the gamma band are useful for this distinction, you can actually compute those from your data and then provide those as features to your classifier. Okay, 
So now let's let's take, make this a little bit more theoretical. So assuming what we want to do with this machine learning approach is to classify uh, cognitive states. Let's say we have a state A and a state B or a state minus one and one. Um, this is a very simple example, um, but it generalizes to other cases. This is a simple example. Why? It's because we only have two classes. You might want to distinguish between three classes, four or even more. Um, but for the sake of uh, convenience, let's stick to two classes. And this is what we call a binary classification. So you take your brain signals. Now you extract feature, um, a feature vector from this and you run your classifier um, and you come up with a prediction of it being of the data belonging to class one or class two. So cognitive state A or cognitive state B. But how does this really work? What, what's actually happening in the classifier? The learning process per se um, can be formalized as the process by which one is choosing and fine tuning the rules or the parameters of a decision function f. That's actually what we're doing. Is we're learning, the algorithm is learning a decision function, right, based on the training set. And then once that decision function has been learned, we apply it on new samples. This is the test set. And we try to see how well it manages to make correct predictions. Um, let's look at this with a visual example. Imagining here we have two types of features. So these two, these are two features of brain activity. Um, label one and label minus one. You can see here your yellow dots and the blue dots. These belong to the two different classes, right? We have the two class classification. And we see that it happens that with these two features, these could be anything. So let's say for the sake of, a, of, a, of, a, of argument that this is going to be alpha on the x-axis, uh, so the amplitude of alpha for a specific brain area and the amplitude of gamma for that same brain area, let's say, um, or alpha in two different brain areas. Anyways, just two features. And this allows you for two-dimensional representations. Obviously, in reality, if you're using n features, so it's an n-dimensional space. Um, but you see here that the, your two groups, the two classes that the algorithm is trying to separate, are nicely separated when we look at the data through these two features. And now you can easily imagine that you can draw a line here which separates the two. This can serve as your decision function. And the, the decision would be anything on the right hand side of this, um, of this line would be classified as label one and anything on the left hand side of it um, on the upper side would be um, label minus one. And, and this is now where we look at the generalization. So this was the training set. Now the red dot that you all see on the screen, that's the new data point. Now the, the, the black line has been learned from the training set, the blue and the yellow dots. So they were labeled, right? So the information is provided. Now we don't know about this red dot. But I think you'd all agree that now the algorithm, if it has to make a decision, the trained algorithm that was based on the blue and yellow dots, now has to make a guess of whether this, blue, this red dot is yellow or blue, it will classify it as being blue. And this is exactly what we mean by out of sample generalization. We are generalizing the rule that has been learned on the blue and yellow dots here to a new data point. And we make a prediction. It might be right, it might be wrong, but this is exactly what we do with out of sample generalization. So, um, discuss this in a little bit more detail and more pragmatically. What we do is we have your um, observations. In our case, this can be brain data. So you have uh, N observations. And then you'll split your data into a training set and to a test set. You use the, the training set to train your classifier, the LDA, SVM, a decision tree, random forest. There are many algorithms that are out there that you can play around with. And then you'll apply your classifier to the test data. So you go from a training phase and then you have a test phase. Again, as a reminder, the, the, the test set has not been seen in the training. It's really just to, to quantify how well your algorithm generalizes outside of the training set. So the performance on the test set is what gives you the, the, the decoding accuracy of your classifier. And so some of you um, might be wondering, okay, well, maybe the results I get are gonna depend on how I split my data into training and test set. And of course the answer to that, yes, obviously it will. So what is, what is the solution to that? The solution to that is what we call cross validation. So that, process of, of splitting your data into training set and test set, you actually do that over and over again. And in each iteration, you're changing the part that you're calling training and the part that you're calling your test set. There are many ways to do that. 
And some of the most well-known approaches is um, k-fold cross-validation. And if you're leaving out only one sample or one individual, you can talk about leave one out uh, cross-validation. Okay, another important distinction is the linear versus the nonlinear classifiers. Um, let's uh, see what we mean by this. So on the left-hand side, this is the example I already shown you. Uh, we're looking at brain data uh, represented across two dimensions or two features, X1 and X2. And we see that the blue dots and the yellow dots on the left-hand side here are nicely uh, linearly separable. But imagine you had the distribution on the right-hand side here. Now your data is not linearly not, is separable. So you can't just find a line, a straight line that's gonna cut through your data into the, into the two classes. So how do you solve this problem? Um, this is exactly what we refer to when we look at nonlinear uh, approaches for machine learning. And there are many techniques to do this. So one obvious one uh, would be to say, well, you know, I'm gonna split this into multiple steps. I'm gonna do multiple decisions. This is exactly what we do when we're using decision trees. So you have, for example, here you have, um, you, you'll say everything to the left of this straight line, I consider it to be a blue class and anything on the right is a mixture. In the second step, if the data is on the right hand of this, um, of this second line, I will consider it to be blue. And then you say, if now it was on the left, I'm gonna go to the next decision and see if it's above or below this third line. If it's above, it's blue. And then if it's below, I'm gonna go to the fourth decision. And now I'm gonna see if it's above or below this fourth line. So we've, we've transformed, um, we've solved the problem by having a, a succession of decisions like we do in decision trees. Another approach to solve this problem, and this is uh, something that mathematicians came up with, is the kernel trick. And this is something that mathematicians are great at, of saying you have a problem that is linearly non-separable, a data that is linearly non-separable. Well, if I have tools that address mainly uh, data that are linearly separable, let's just transform and convert the problem into a problem that is linearly separable. And to do this one way is to use the kernel trick you see here, basically you're changing the uh, space. We're going from X1, X2 to a new uh, space here spanned by a Z1, Z2, and Z3. Um, and by applying a transformation to the, the values in the data, as you can see here, we end up with a new space where the data, the representation of the data now can be separated uh, linearly. And then we can, in this new space now, the transformed space, uh, we can now use um, our linear uh, approaches. Now, what classifiers can you use? There's a huge number of classifiers that you can explore and they have all their different uh, strengths and limitations. Um, I, I won't have time here to go through all of them. I'm just gonna take two examples and show you very quickly, just uh, in choosing easy ones, to just give you an intuition, again, for those of you who are not familiar with machine learning. So um, the first one is K nearest neighbors, K and N. Um, and the idea here is very simple. Um, you have the blue dots, the red dots. You have this white dot here, and we don't know yet whether it should be classified as red or blue. The KNN algorithm, what it's gonna do is going to simply say, well, what I'm going to do is I'm just gonna look at the neighbors. I'll see what the neighbors, if they're supporting this team, if most of them are supporting uh, this team, probably this is also supporting that team. In other words, in this case here, um, we set k equal to nine. So we're looking at the nine nearest neighbors to the white dot here in the middle. And if you count the neighbors, you see that you have seven of the nine neighbors are red, two are blue. And so obviously the um, algorithm is gonna predict that this white dot should actually be red. So classified as a red dot. That's the KNN, looking at just the, the predominance uh, within the neighbors. A decision tree is a succession of decisions. So let's assume we're talking about a fruit. Your first color, your first question is, um, so at the root of the tree is, what is the color of the, the sample that I'm looking at? Is it green, is it yellow, is it red? Um, if it's green, then the next question is, okay, what is the size? Is it big, medium, or small? If it's big, I'll say it's a watermelon. If it's medium, I'll say it's an apple. And if it's small, I go for grape, and so on and so forth. So you have different levels um, within, within this decision tree. And as you can see, it's a succession of decisions and it's a quite an easy approach. So now, hopefully you're all familiar with the notion of supervised learning, training on, 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 on training data, and then seeing how well it generalizes to the, to the test set. And when I'm training, I am giving the solutions, so it's labeled data. 
But now let's talk about unsupervised learning. In unsupervised learning, I don't have the class label. So what I'm doing is I'm trying to extract from the data um, subgroups um, according to some rules. And there are many techniques to do that. I won't go into the details, but uh, clustering techniques is something that some of you are probably uh, familiar with. You can use k-means, hierarchical clustering to identify within the data clouds of, of, of points, as you can see here. And then you can identify the centroids of these, of these, for example, three clouds. And then when you have a new, new data point, you can see, is it closer to which one of these centroids? And that would be one way of, of classifying the clouds. Okay, another notion that is really critical and important for machine learning, if you plan to apply it in your data, is to look at what we call underfitting or overfitting. Um, so this, this relates to the, um, the, uh, the utility of your model that has been trained. So you're training it on data. Um, and once you've finished that training, you might end up with a good model. In other words, a model that's gonna have a good level of generalization in terms of performance onto unseen data. Uh, but you can also have um, an underfitting and an overfitting condition. An underfitting is, is gonna be on the left-hand side here. It's the case where the data maybe did not have sufficient um, amounts of data, or you didn't use the the most adaptive algorithm, but anyways, you ended up with um, a decision uh, function for your model that doesn't generalize properly uh, because it underfits the data. It didn't really capture the structure um, of the data. Maybe there's no structure in the data, but anyways, when you have underfitting, you're not able to generalize properly. So that's not a good situation. There's another situation that you want to avoid and that's overfitting. And this is what you see on the right-hand side. Um, and that's overlearning. And obviously, this is something I don't tell my six-year-old that there's such a thing as overlearning. I uh, always encourage him to learn more. But in fact, indeed, there is something that I would be overlearning and that we would like to avoid, and it's overfitting. And what is overfitting? It's basically when, you're, when you're, uh, the data in the training set is used by your algorithm, and it fits so well that training set, right? It's, it fits like a glove and makes close to no error whatsoever on the training data. So it's so specific to that training data that now if the new data point outside of the sample that you wanna classify um, as unseen data, if that deviates even just a little bit from your distribution that you used to learn, you're going to make mistakes. In other words, you're great and really good on the training, but you don't, the performance is really bad out of the training set. And that's an overfitting case. And that's obviously something that you want to avoid. Um, another distinction is classification versus regression. This is a very easy one. In the case of classifications, obviously we're looking at identifying classes. So you predict the class label. Uh, you can have two, but you can have um, a large number of classes. In the case of regression, uh, you're basically trying to, uh, to predict continuous value. And I think this is something you know, but you can also use obviously a regression in a machine learning approach where you have a subset of your data, your training, and that allows you to um, to learn a, uh, a regression um, model, and then you apply that onto new data and, and you can see how that works. One of the very final um, points I'd like to mention here in this quick overview of, of, of machine learning methods uh, is uh, the notion of shallow versus deep learning or classical or traditional approaches compared to um, deep learning or deep neural networks. So in the case of, of shallow learning, we often refer to conventional machine learning pipelines um, where we start off by um, extracting features. We often talk about handcrafted features to train our models. Um, whereas in deep learning approaches, uh, this is uh, based on uh, deep neural networks, um, where it's a more lengthy and more computationally expensive machine learning pipeline, where you're doing both at the same time. So you're learning the features from the data and your training model. But you don't, you don't, most of the time, you don't start off by extracting the features. You provide the full data, um, and then you try to learn representations within that data. And this is typically what is, uh, what is explored with, um, with deep uh, neural networks. Um, and we talk of, often about what we call representation learning. So again, shallow learning is as you have your input, you extract the features, and then you train, you have your classifier, you have your output. In the case of deep learning, you're doing the feature extraction and the classifier classification of the, of the learning of your model uh, simultaneously. 
Um, many of you are familiar with the, the many uh, successes being reported in the literature using uh, convolutional neural networks as an example of deep learning um, to classify, for instance, images going through these different layers within the neural network until you get to the output. Um, it has been um, used a lot, um, for example, in the case where um, you're trying to guess um, these um, numbers here from the MNIST data set. And interestingly, you can try, it's not that easy as when you're using handcrafted features, but you can open the hood and look at your different convolutional layers and try to see what these different layers are learning in this um, data-driven um, manner and see um, what happens at the different layers. And this has been quite useful also to try and um, make comparisons between um, the way neural artificial neural networks learn and the way uh, brain networks process information and try to find some similarities between the two along some sort of hierarchical representation of, um, of the data and the, and the processes. Um, many fun things that can be explored using convolutional neural networks. I'm sure you've seen many uh, of these examples where you can do actually quite amazing stuff uh, based on um, convolutional neural networks. I won't go into more details there. I'm going to quickly uh, end up this part by talking about some of the performance metrics that, that uh, you do. So how, how do you know whether your machine learning algorithm is giving you something useful and something that you would like to go on and, and maybe use for your publication and say that you found something interesting. Uh, so in terms of classification, the, the main metrics are classification accuracy, logarithmic loss, areas under the curve, confusion matrix, and classification report. Uh, for the regression metrics, uh, the, the usuals, mean absolute error, mean squared error, and R squared. Um, I will only briefly talk about classification accuracy and the confusion matrix. So classification accuracy is something that we've seen before. In the example I've shown you, I've shown you at the very beginning, if you are able to make uh, three correct um, uh, responses out of four, uh, you're at the success rate of 75% on your test set. So that's your decoder uh, accuracy. Um, now, more interestingly, you can do something a little bit more interesting than just looking at the number of, of, of errors and, and, and the rate of success predictions uh, by using something we call the confusion matrix. And what the confusion matrix does, it tells you, you can see here on the left-hand side, these are the real labels of your data, 0, 1, 2, and 3, for let's say four different brain states. And at the bottom here is the predictive class. So this is again, 0, 1, 2, 3. Um, and so obviously, if your classifier is doing a great job and never makes a mistake, each of those uh, real label, the, the real label would always correspond to the predicted label or the other way around. The predicted label would correspond to the real label. So you'll have, uh, as I'm sure this makes sense to, to all of you, you have a diagonal matrix here, only values across the diagonal. That's if it's working perfectly well. Obviously that's not always the case. And you'll have, for example, here, um, the true label class one, which is over here, most of the time gets, uh, identified by the algorithm as class one. So that makes sense. This is why this is yellow. But in some cases it gets put into class zero or in class two. Uh, so this is actually quite interesting because this tells us um, that for example, your, your, your classifier never mistakes your class one for class two, right? It either puts it in one, which is good or in zero or in two. So this tells you where is your classifier going wrong. So if you're fine tuning or you're trying to, 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 um, to improve your model, this gives you insights uh, of what is happening, where, where is your classifier going wrong and whether you need more data to help it out or you need to work on a better um, uh, identification of the hyperparameters for your algorithm. Okay, so obviously if you have two classes, your chance left is 50%, four classes, and so on and so forth. But what is to be careful about these chances? So obviously, if you, if you have a classifier and you're trying to classify between patients and controls, um, and your classifier gives you a 58% classification accuracy, well, you might be tempted to say, well, that's above chance level. Chance level is 50%. So is your 58% decoder accuracy for your classifier, is that a good thing? And should you run off and start writing the paper with your 58% classification accuracy? Of course, this is just a rhetorical question. I'm sure all of you are, uh, already know this. Obviously, that's not the way these things work. And you need to run a statistical analysis 
on your classif classification accuracy to be able to see whether it is rel reliable or not. Because one of the things that you know, will obviously have an impact is the data points. Now, if you have only 10 data points, you won't necessarily be very surprised to have seven correct predictions out of the 10, if you only had 10, right? That's 70%, but it could still happen by chance. So the chance level is purely theoretical. You would need to have an assessment um, of the statistical significance of the decoding accuracy. And we, we, we wrote just a, an introductory paper about this just to highlight this uh, in 2015, if you're interested. Um, and so, so this is uh, where a small red flag uh, needs to be raised. And, and, uh, and this is something that I, I, thankfully I hear this less now than, than I did uh, a while ago. But in some cases, um, collaborators would say, well, the p-values on the study, you know, I, I just not cutting it and we knocked that 0 0.05. Um, so we're trying, we're thinking about using a machine learning approach instead to see if we can just, uh, you know, achieve a good decoding accuracy and, you know, work our way around statistics because it doesn't seem that we have enough statistical power. Uh, of course, that's, that's not the way it works. You can't just uh, work your way around statistics, avoiding them by saying, I'm moving to a machine learning and data-driven approach. Um, that's, that's not the way it works because you will still have to run a statistical analysis to see how robust is your decoding accuracy. Um, so, so yeah, as I said, you can't work your way, way around statistics by switching to uh, machine learning. Um, you'll need to uh, look at the um, um, statistical um, um, value of, of your classifier. Um, and also, and I think this is even more important, is that we're not asking the same questions when we're using statistical returns and out of sample generalization. So the questions we're answering are different, are subtly different, and uh, we should not make that mistake of, of thinking it's doing the same thing. And there's a nice paper many of you might be familiar with by Danilo, Danilo Bizdok in Frontiers Neuroscience 2017, which directly explores this relationship between classical statistics and statistical learning um, in uh, imaging neuroscience. Um, yeah, so this is just an excerpt out of that paper and I, I won't go into the details of this uh, right now. Um, so, but this is an important point. Um, an observed effect in the brain with statistically significant p-value does not necessarily mean that it generalizes to future brain recordings, right? And this is really important because in many papers, if you come to think of it, and specifically in neuroscience and neuroimaging, you might have 20, 30, 40 or more subjects. And the claims we make about our research is that this is the way the human brain functions based on that sample. So actually what we're really trying to do is we're trying to generalize to the population, but we're not really generalizing when we're using these um, um, methods that were applied on the full data set. Um, and so I think this is an interesting thing to keep in mind because when you're doing um, data, general, when you're doing general, out of sample generalization, that's closer to what we try to do conceptually when we are uh, publishing reports in neuroscience um, and trying to say um, that our results probably will hold for the next subject that comes into the lab, right? So uh, another important point is conversely, an effect that is successfully captured by a learning algorithm in terms of out of sample generalization does not imply necessarily that you have a significant p-value if you run a classical non-hypothesis test. Okay? These things are subtly different. And I think um, it's, it's important to, to understand that distinction. So conventional statistical analysis of your data, comparison of your means, for instance, and machine learning classifier out of sample generalization are two conceptually different truths. They're both yummy, but they're probably yummy in different ways. So I am just encouraging everyone that and is moving into this uh, field to be aware of the distinction. So there are good reasons though to be excited about using machine learning um, to your brain data analytics pipeline. Um, and I'll um, try to um, summarize here a few of these are my personal favorites are many more. Um, first of all, there's something we call cross temporal generalization. And this is a very cool technique. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, this is basically where you, you train your model at a data point at, the, at some point in time, T1. And then once that model is trained, you can keep it, you freeze that model, and then you apply it on data that comes from another time in point. And you see whether 
it still is able to classify correctly. If it does, it's telling you that the processes that are at play at time t1 are also valid or also continue to be active at the time t2. Okay, so this tells you about the, the temporal generalization of a process and allows you to potentially explore whether some of the processes that we're looking at in cognitive neuroscience, if they extend over time or if they, they reoccur over time, um, which could be, for example, interesting when we're looking at notions such as replay, memory replay, for instance. Another thing that I, that I find quite interesting when we applying these tools to our data is feature importance. Features importance, uh, importance quantifies to what extent different features that you're feeding into your classifier lead to a good classification weight. If they do, they are probably important for the classification. And as cognitive science, neuroscientists it tells us, this is probably important for the distinction between the two classes that I'm looking at, be it patients and controls or two experimental conditions in, in subjects that I'm looking at. So they, the, the feature importance can be neuroscientifically relevant. A third thing that I uh, also very much excited about is, is transfer learning and domain adaptation. So what this is, is basically you train your algorithm, your model, your machine learning model to solve the task on a specific data set or a specific question. And then you use that model that has been now trained on that data set on that data distribution and you apply it to a new question and you see how well it does. This can be very useful in terms of identifying similar processes that are happening across tasks or in terms of trying to develop tasks that are um, models that are more generalizable and that can solve several problems at the same time. It, it is not always uh, easy to achieve um, and there are many issues uh, that need to be tackled, uh, including the notion of domain adaptation. So you might want to um, bring in some of your data from the second distribution into the first distribution when you're training your algorithm without the labels, but you can still just bring in that data to um, make your distributions closer if they're too, if they're too far apart. We, we can discuss this later. Um, another thing that is important is feature learning and representation or representation learning. I think this is, some, so this is something obviously related to the use of deep learning um, in cognitive neuroscience and in neuroimaging. Um, and so here, this is the move when you're moving away from handcrafted features to given, giving the raw data to your, to your classifier and then trying to open the hood and explore um, how did the, 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 the artificial neural network solve the problem? What were the representations that were learned? And can we make any interpretations of those neuroscientifically? The question of interpretation, and I'm so, so this, sure this is something important for many of you, uh, is something that needs to be discussed in this context. How well can we interpret um, findings that come from applying deep learning to uh, cognitive neuroscience or uh, neuroimaging data. And then finally, I think that um, there are many tools that are being currently developed and there are many more to come in the field of computer science related to machine learning and um, uh, to deep learning that provides additional dimensionality reduction tools for us and visualization tools. These involve things like TSNI or UMAPS um, that allow us to gain insights by visualizing the data in low dimensional uh, spaces. Okay, and just to give you one example of cross temporal pattern generalization, this is a study in 2014 in uh, trends in um, cognitive science um, ticks, um, published by Jean Rémy King and Stanislas Duran. As you can see here, this is basically what we see is generalization time on the y on the x axis. Um, and the training time on the x-axis. And so this is a way, to, as I was saying before, to tap into um, the dynamics of the temporal dynamics of the processes. So is a process that is able to solve a task, a classification task at time t1, how well does it perform at other times? So for example, typically in the, the bottom figure here, and this is taken from a paper by uh, Stokes and, and colleagues, um, you see that it becomes larger uh, over here, the, the, the red area indicating that there's generalization across time. If it's only on the diagonal, then it only works for at each time point and does not uh, generalize. Um, we've also used this in a number of studies in our group so far. This is just one of them published um, last year in Plus Biology, looking at decision-making 
I won't have time to go in detail of the study, but I'll just to show you here again, the notion of temporal generalization can be used to um, identify that in the cases of, um, this was a, a decision-making task, um, we compared an instructed saccade task to a, a free choice saccade task. And we see in the free choice saccade that um, processes of decision-making last longer in time. And the way, one way to visualize that is by using these cross temporal generalization and seeing that the decoding is lasts longer in time, as you can see here on the right-hand side of, of these, uh, these two papers. Um, I'd be happy to discuss that further, yes. And I can highly recommend this paper in TICS 2015 by Mark Stokes. Um, so a few things to uh, keep in mind um, when you're uh, attempting to use machine learning for those of you who are considering to do this. Um, this applies to EEG and MEG data, which we use a lot in the lab, also the cranial EEG, but many of this is, um, uh, is true in general, that you need to watch out for a number of things. First of all, overfitting. Now you're all experts and you know that overfitting comes when, you're, when the training went wrong. So your, your model is really good at the training, but does not generalize out of the training. You need to make sure that you're not violate, violating any strict training and test data separations. So you can't train your model on data and then use some of that same data and make predictions. Obviously that, that, that's, uh, that's a bias, that's a flaw. So um, you need to make sure that you have strict separation between training and test. Imbalanced data can be a problem, of course. Sample size is always a problem. Um, and of course, be aware of angry pandas. Okay, um, as this is recorded, um, I won't uh, read the details here, but I just wanted to provide here five um, points uh, and uh, places where you can go start if you want to look at some papers that have looked into some of these points if you're new to the field. Uh, and also to answer the question that I often get, where do we start if you want to do this? Um, the Scikit library is an outstanding library uh, to use. I think there are many, many more tools that you can uh, explore when you want to, uh, when you want to run uh, machine learning uh, on your data. But obviously you need also a sound understanding of the theory behind it and a sound understanding of cross-validation and of the issues that I mentioned before uh, to make sure that uh, you're not making any silly mistakes. Okay, so I'm gonna try to wrap up quickly the machine learning part, um, but um, I'm nearly done. So this is a virtual meeting, so it's not really take home for you, but probably this is uh, my home delivery service for you. Machine learning is opening up many new opportunities in, in all fields of research, including neuroscience. However, there's no magic. Machine learning learns the rules from, in many cases, a lot of data. And I would recommend that you try to ignore the AI buzz. So use the best tools that address your specific question. So I, I, say, I tell this mainly to the students. I have many students that sometimes feel that they have to use a machine learning for their work to, to, be, uh, to be exciting, but that's not the case. You really need to tailor the, use the tools that are best to address your questions. It sounds silly and stupid to say so, but I think it's worth repeating over and over again. Now, machine learning has some nice tools that can enhance your classical analysis. So you can run your classical analysis and then you can say, well, what is, what is it that I could gain more out of using some of these machine learning approaches? Are there any functionalities such as cross temporal validation um, or transfer learning that I can incorporate into my research? Obviously garbage in, garbage out. Um, that's something that we all know, but I think I would also would like to highlight that also bias in and bias out. So there's a lot of forms of biases in, in machine learning and AI, and it's been talked about a lot. So you need to really make sure that this is something that you're aware of. What are you feeding your classifier at the training? Because any bias that goes in at the time of training is going to create a bias uh, classifier. And to answer the question that we started off this with um, related to the hypothesis driven versus data driven, um, I'd like to say hypothesis testing is not dead, of course not, um, but it can work hand in hand with these data driven techniques. Um, and um, many components of data driven research um, actually include hypothesis uh, embedded within them, whether you would like to acknowledge it or not. But if you're doing machine learning and you're using handcrafted features, you are going to choose a, a set of features that you think are useful. By doing so, you are incorporating hypotheses into your data-driven research. 
which brings uh, to the point the question of uh, data informed uh, versus data driven. Maybe we need to think more about data informed. So we're using data to inform our choice um, of tools, but also to train the tools to identify patterns and be able to generalize. Right? It's not just the availability of data that's, that's changed the whole thing. Okay, so that, that brings the, the major part of this talk to, um, to an end. Uh, I only have, uh, a, well, I do have quite a bit of slides, before, but I'll, I'll see what I can get through here. So, um, so that was an introduction to the basics of machine learning, and I hope that it was useful to some of you, at least, who are unfamiliar with, with, uh, with this. So now I'm going to talk briefly about how these tools um, are being incorporated in, uh, in the relationship to cognitive neuroscience or brain imaging, and how can brain science also benefit the development of such tools. So there's the first direction is going from brain and our knowledge of, of how the brain functions towards AI, uh, which we refer to as brain-inspired AI. And the other direction is going from AI to the brain. So this would be AI-powered uh, brain science. Um, and so this is a bit more, um, so the first direction is really important too, but this is the one that's been explored with more success and let's say with um, more extensively in the past. Um, so using machine learning as a tool to advance our understanding of brain function and dysfunction. And this can be done in different ways. How can you really use AI to help your cognitive neuroscience research or psychology research questions? Uh, one of them is to use it as a reverse engineering tool. So can I build a model using these networks or these, these uh, machine learning algorithms and then see how well that model predicts real brain data? Um, that, that relationship with the, the matching between the two can inform us and can allow us to create new models um, of brain function. The second approach this is more of a data mining tool is that we use many features across much, much, multiple dimensions, maybe also mixing different types of modalities and we can apply machine learning algorithms uh, to that data. So for the, for the reverse engineering uh, approach, we take uh, one way this has been used is, for example, to train an algorithm here, an artificial neural network, for example, to categorize images. Now, you can then look at how the human brain does the same task. You can give the same task to the human brain and you can look at the categorization of images, for example, you no know, tools, faces, animals, landscapes, and so on and so forth. And then you can look at the hierarchy of visual processing in the biological network here going from V1 um, to, uh, to a TE, for example, or inferior temporal lobe. And then you can, you can look at the, um, the, um, the representations across different layers of your artificial neural network, and you can try to compare those. And that's one way that researchers are using to try and explore similarities and maybe try to fine tune and tweak uh, artificial neural networks to make them more brain-like or more uh, human brain-like um, and use that as um, to identify new knowledge. I don't have the time to go in this, into this, but there's a, a neat paper by Federer 2020 that you can look into if you're interested in this type of, of reverse engineering. Now, AI is a data uh, mining tool, uh, and this is something that we're using quite a bit in the lab, is um, brain decoding. So using these methods to, uh, to um, to, as a tool for, uh, for cognitive neuroscience research. And so we have this yin and yang between brain decoding and brain encoding. By brain encoding, we understand uh, when you're going on from, from the behavior or from the conditions or from the groups of subjects versus patients to predicting the actual brain data. By brain decoding, we're doing the opposite. We're looking at the, rec the recordings, um, the neuroimaging data or the EEG data or the MEG data, and based on that, we try to predict the cognitive task or whether we're, we're, the data comes from a patient or from a control um, subject. So these obviously have a lot of utilities for cognitive neuroscience, systems neuroscience, um, and clinical neuroscience. So the way we do this in the lab is we take MEG, EEG, or trail EEG most of the time. We run advanced signal processing tools, and then we come with a machine learning framework to do classification or decoding or prediction of a number of things. Um, as I said, um, we apply this to many, many different types of cognitive tasks, including decision-making, motor intentions. We have a sub uh, study looking at meditation. Uh, we're looking at sleep stages. Uh, we're looking at the ability to predict from the data dream, um, the high versus low dream recall. Um, 
We've also been looking at the ability to use uh, machine learning to identify from your brain signals um, the, 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 the person that identifies. So whether basically fingerprinting based on EEG data. Um, also brain disorders, and I have some examples of schizophrenia that I can, that I can share and uh, many more. Um, so now, depending on the time that I still have, I have prepared some, some examples. And this is maybe a good point to ask uh, Tristan um, how much time I can still take, but I'd love to show you maybe one or two examples of, of study. Um, so although, although we are, although we are, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, although we are, you know, on the, on the clock because you started at 34, so you one hour. Um, oh, okay. Uh, it'd be nice uh, for the, for the people in the in the virtual room to see one of your projects at least you know to a certain degree you know to so we can talk about all your research you yeah. know in particular too and maybe if there are other questions then you you can have another five minutes in the in during the discussion to show more right yes so yeah I'll, I'll i'll scan through them relatively quickly and then we can come back to them afterwards if there are questions uh, let's do that thank you Tristan. Okay, so yeah, I choose a fun one here, which is our high end versus low dream recall study. Um, and the question at the basis of this is how can some people remember their dreams more than others? Um, is there anything to do with the brains being different? And our current understanding of, of, of dream recall is quite fragmented. So there are complex experiments to be done. Um, there's a wide variety of brain measurement techniques that have been used, uh, the data is high dimensional. So the question we ask is can we? learn more about the neural basis of dream recall by combining EEG and machine learning. And this is a study, um, uh, a collaboration with Perrine Ruby in Lyon and Tarek Lejnev postdoc in the lab, Arthur Degas, PhD in the lab, um, Arne Gosch here uh, also in Montreal at Mila, uh, collaborator, and Aniruda Kentour, um, master student and the collaborator, um, Jean-Baptiste Echelo. Um, and in the study, very briefly, we had 1,000 people answer questionnaires about their uh, sleep and dream habits, whether they remember their dreams a lot or not. And then based on that, we identified two groups, the high dream recallers and the low dream recallers. The high dream recallers were identified as those who dream, um, more, they say they remember their dreams more than three mornings per week. Uh, and if they said that they remember their dreams less than two mornings per month, that would be then classified as a low recaller. We took 18 from each group um, and we had them come to the lab um, and uh, their EEG was, uh, was recorded um, out of these 36 subjects. Uh, we also had EOG and EMG monitoring and it was a night channel EEG data. And so then we ran, we used a number of tools to try and um, based on handcrafted features and now we all know what handcrafted features are and we used a linear discriminant analysis or machine learning approach to classify and try to predict high versus the low dream recalls. Now in terms of features, uh, we looked at a number of things, but for this specific analysis here, we relied on looking at the power spectrum. So power in different frequency bands, as you can see here, um, blue is for the low dream recallers and orange, red is for the high dream recallers. This is the power spectrum. Um, and um, we also computed the time covariance matrices and the co-spectra. So basically the frequency domain equivalent um, of that. Um, and um, this is work by a PhD student, um, Arthur Degas in the lab. Uh, and I'm just showing you here the example of sleep stage S2. And during sleep stage S2, we see the power for the high dream recallers here in alpha, sigma, and beta bands. And the same thing for the low dream recallers. And you can run statistical classification, statistical analysis uh, on that data. But you can also, this is the, the, the last column here. This is the decoding accuracy obtained with, with LDA. And it allows you to identify which electrodes provide significant classification and differentiate between the two and what frequency bands seems to be most relevant for the classification. And then you can take that information and you go um, try to explore some uh, interpretations based on that and given what we know from, from, from the literature. Um, without, we won't have time to go into the details, but we took the same data set and we trained um, a deep neural network, a convolutional neural network to classify again between high and low dream, dream recallers. Um, and we showed that we were able to uh, achieve um, a good classification rate. And we, we found that this worked in different sleep stages. Um, and then one thing that is interesting here is uh, this is using TSNE representations of the data points. 
you can train an algorithm to identify individuals and train another one to identify high and low dream recallers just to make sure that the identification of high and low dream recallers is not actually based on identifying the, is not using the information about different individuals. Um, and this is something that we, we checked here and as we have discussed. Um, again, as I said, the tricky part about deep learning, and this is always a criticism that we hear, is that it's a black box and we can interpret. So there are some tools that, that allow you to, to tackle this issue. One of them is using guided backpropagation, and you can look at the, the spectral information within the segments that allow for good classification. And we found results that seem to be coherent with the literature. So I'm not gonna go through the summary of this study, but basically that was one example. Um, the other one I had is about um, schizophrenia. Um, I won't have time for it. I'll just say, tell you that this is a collaboration uh, with, uh, with Cardiff, with Prish Singh, and this is my uh, PhD, what she now finished her PhD, Gulnush Alamian, who led the study. And did exactly the same thing. We took MEG data from patients with schizophrenia and controls, um, and we computed many brain features, including multi-factor coefficients, Hurst exponents, permutation entropy, spectral power, and detrended fluctuation analysis. And we looked at the, de the decoding power that we can achieve when we fed these into a classifier to uh, distinguish between controls and patients. And again, the idea here is not to use this as a diagnostic tools. Um, clinicians are well uh, better suited and uh, have a, well, better performance in our algorithms in identifying patients with schizophrenia. They don't need us. But the point here is by identifying which features gives you the best decoding accuracy, and then it opens the door to exploring the, the features that are probably being altered in pathology. So um, these are the results. The paper has been published, so, so I can refer you to that if you want. But it's, uh, it's nice because you, you can look at the decoding power that I explained before. Of, as a topograph topographical map here across the brain and it identifies areas where the decoding accuracy is significant. That's the conclusion for that. I will not talk about the transfer learning. I don't have time, but I'll be happy to come back to this later. Uh, this is the last point about the unique center that I'm directing. The idea is to bridge neuroscience and AI. We were created in 2019. Um, we're trying to, uh, to, to improve the, the collaboration and the interaction between neuroscientists and AI by actually bringing these communities to actually work together by supervising and co-supervising students and trainees. Um, so we're looking at the field of neuro AI integration. Uh, we have 760 researchers currently, 90 in total with our collaborators. There's a website, there's also a Twitter account, and I, there's a meeting that we organize called the Montreal AI and Neuroscience called the main community that you're all welcome to join. Last year, we had over 2000 participants um, and we're looking forward to having Maine 2021 uh, happen in December. So feel free to, um, to, keep, to stay in touch so that you can hear about this event. Um, we'll be happy to see you there. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I hopefully you didn't go way too much above the time that I, that I had, and I look forward to discussing with all of you. Thank you very much for having me. Great. Uh, show me in, in uh, clapping however you want virtually. I usually just basically try to real clap. Um, and of course, I, I opened the virtual floor for... Shall I stop sharing my slides, Tristan? Um, yeah, I mean, they might ask you to bring it back, but I think that uh, um, okay. it's fine. I'm gonna stop the recording so people are not shy. Um,